Uh, yep. 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 Everyone can hear me in Sashlike? Sweet. So just before I start, this is the first time I'm doing a talk, so there are any cock ups, you know. Park the uh, complaints till later. Uh, what am I going to be talking about? App building 101. We're fairly lucky here in Sydney the last couple of years. There's been a lot of startups and things like that. Uh, and a, a big sort of question is there's a lot of people with fairly deep enterprise experience of one form or another. You know, they know things about a certain part of a certain business. Generally, they go, if we did it like so, we could add value. This is quite exciting for most people. And then they sort of don't really know where to go from that. So that's kind of the approach. We're going to go very quickly over what it takes to go from you have a computer and an idea, hopefully with Ubuntu on it, but you have a computer and an idea, all the way through to uh, let's, let's put it up online and we can have a play kind of thing. Um, I'm not going to get hugely into what to do with when you have an idea. It's more, there's a couple of standard functions that every app generally needs. You want some sort of login, log out, you want some sort of groups, you want some sort of roles, you know, people are going to log in and do things. Uh, and, and, and it's all fairly standardized stuff. And what I'm going to try and show you is how it's fairly straightforward to download a pretty close to working sort of thing and then go create a what's called an SPA or single page application from there. Um, what I won't be covering is the deploy, which uh, you know, I was having a chat with Robert when we were talking about this. Maybe we'll do as a sort of second one. The deploy is where there's a lot more Ubuntu and Linux related stuff, right? That's the reality of it. Uh, most of the stuff you're going to be seeing, I'm sure somebody noticed that I am actually just doing this on a Windows laptop. So, you know, it's, it's fairly standardized stuff. I'll show you some of the tools. I won't be doing any compiles and runs. I have built a couple of really small projects and stuck them up online, and hopefully we'll be able to play with that. Uh, let's, let's get started then. So just really quickly, app building 101. What we're going to be doing is go through a structure. First, I'm going to be talking about um, a JavaScript framework called Meteor. What, what, what is a JavaScript framework? JavaScript, as you may or may not know, is a language that you can embed into websites. Fundamentally, that's how it started. It's gotten a little bit more advanced over, over the years, and now we're at the point where you can use JavaScript frameworks for both client-side and server-side stuff. The first uh, iteration of this was probably Node, the serious one. And since then, we've had a bunch of JavaScript frameworks that make it quite easy to get up and running. There are some things that it is a little bit tricky to do, but uh, we're going to go over that. I'll talk a little bit about uh, why Meteor and what we can do with it. Uh, and over the, over the course of this, basically, what we're trying to do is download something, hit some sort of run or compile that goes away and does a compile, and then we have a website. Basically, that's what we're, we're looking to do. Through it, I'm also going to talk about a couple of the really simple tools that we use. We'll talk a little bit about front-end style stuff, how to style it a little bit nicely. Then I'm going to get into how to handle CSS and such like that. Keep in mind, these are single-page apps. So fundamentally, there's not a lot of, let's go here, let's go there, let's, you know, it's just all happening in one giant doohickey. It's a technical term, by the way, doohickey. Um, we're also going to get into linting, which is how to use uh, tools to ensure your code gets better over time. Uh, we're going to do a little bit about testing, and I'm going to show you how to do some basic documentation of your code. Right? It's just sort of code quality kind of thing. OK, what do you need when you're starting Meteor? This is obviously a screenshot of, uh, of uh, terminal out of Ubuntu. You need basically three things. The first thing you need is what's called NVM. NVM is Node Version Manager. Uh, Node is the primary base piece of code we're going to be using. Node Version Manager quite nicely manages different versions of Node. The JavaScript community in general is moving quite quickly, and therefore things break and such like. What you want to do is start with one version of Node, get comfortable with it, and stick with it, because the biggest problem is probably 
dependencies and going out and finding open source software to do what you need. So as you can see on the first line of the screenshot, I've got NVM version 0320. Um, most of these are pretty straightforward to install. You go online, you Google it basically, have a look for NVM and it'll be a script that you can run. You open up your terminal, you install it, and then you have NVM. The next thing I've got is Node. Uh, the way I installed Node was via NVM, as, and you can see it's already done. When I have a look at which node, which is basically asking Ubuntu, what version of Node do you have? It gives me an answer saying, within NVM, I've got versions, and it's v4.6.0. Then I've done uh, Meteor version, and I've got 1.4.2. Installing Meteor itself is literally that curl command just after. It's one line, and you can see it doesn't install. It comes down, it asks you for password, and that's Meteor installed. So these are the three major dependencies that, that you need to get onto your computer pretty much to start with. Uh, it quite helpfully also tells you what you need to do to get started fast. Um, you go Meteor Create, you make up basically an app name, and it'll effectively install a small, fully working single page application for you. Part of this is just getting up and running quickly because we don't want to spend too much time learning about stuff if we're not going to use it, right? Um, so that, that's the entire sort of prerequisites that you need. Quickly mention, the screenshot is a couple of weeks old. Uh, the reason I chose Node 4.6 at the time was that was what's called the LTS, the long-term supported version. That's actually changed to 6.9 in the last two weeks. It did make a huge difference. When I did the update, I thought something would break, but given what we're doing with Meteor is actually so simple. Uh, fairly impressively for Ubuntu, at least, well, well, Unix packages, it, it works straight out of the box. Uh, let's talk about frameworks. I have a comment where I stole this from. I didn't write any of this. But basically, you're talking Node. There's a couple of different models. They're all, in essence, iterations of MVC in some way, shape, or form, right? Model view controller. Um, what can you do? So there's obviously Angular, which is Google's product, and that's sort of front-endy stuff. Polymer is more the graphics stuff. There's React, which is Facebook's product. Um, Aurelia is another open source one. Meteor is the one we're going to be playing with. Uh, there's Ember, there's Backbone. All of these are fundamentally, we have code. We don't want to write a whole heap of code to get started. I want to do in it something. So I just want to tell one of these frameworks, create a new application for me, hit enter, and back. Right? That's essentially why we're using frameworks. It also means that you're using good vetted code for the most part. And there's forums, so you can Google stuff and stack overflow stuff. Uh, principally, that's how you work things out, and generally, that's what you would do. Uh, we're going to go with uh, Meteor. There's a couple of reasons I chose Meteor. Uh, when when I start when I started working on the project that I am at the moment, and and it was mostly because Angular one was getting uh, outdated. Angular two was out, but not really all that stable. They weren't backwards compatible. Meteor actually has its own front end called Blaze. Uh, Blaze is actually really good fun to work with and works out of the box. The demo I did, or I'm going to do, is going to be Meteor as sort of a more back, back end sort of thing, and React as the front end. Uh, it gives us a couple of options, mostly because Facebook is spending a lot of time and money building components, which means we can steal these and apologies, open source these and uh, work with work with them, right? So it's all it's all good vetted code, smart people are working on it, it's stable, that sort of thing. Okay, so what happens when I actually type in that line of code, which is Meteor Create Simple App? As the documentation showed, that's essentially one line. So you go Meteor Create and you have your app name. And then it creates the app. You get to do C D simple app, which is go into the folder of the app, and then you literally type Meteor, and that's how you run it, right? So does that nods? Yes? Excellent. Um, so I've got Workspace Meteor. I do CD Simple App because it's told me to. 
and then I go ls, which is the Ubuntu command for let's look at some files and folders. You can see this client package.json and server, a screenshot of what it looks like is just below that. And that's literally an entire single page app. It is very simple and it isn't going to do very much. But fundamentally, we're talking about an app that's been built, we can run, and we'll do stuff on, obviously, in localhost. We haven't done any, uh, I suppose I should explain localhost really quickly. Localhost is just a server that you have on your computer, which you're using for dev. Once you're done into deploy, you generally either stick it into staging, UAT, whatever, make its way through, and then go into production. Uh, depending on how interested people are, I'll show one quick command to do that, but we're, we're not really going to go into deployment today. Okay, so we've got this simple app thing. How do we look at it? How do we start working with it? Right now, it's just files and folders on our computer. Okay, so again, now the next screenshot, I'm in the simple app folder, which we cd into. I literally type in Meteor, and it does those couple of commands, app running at localhost 3000. So I open up my uh, browser. Generally, uh, Chrome or Firefox, depends on what you're comfortable with. Uh, the Internet Explorer, let's leave that on the side, mostly because it's outdated and has problems. But even Edge doesn't really have a lot of support for this sort of coding. Obviously, if you're doing working on Microsoft Stack, Edge makes a lot more sense, especially if you've got everything tied up to sort of Azure and everything around it. Um, now that we're running this simple app, which is, as we saw on the previous slide, you know, a couple of folders and a couple of files, this is literally what it looks like. That is an actual running app sitting there. And you can see there's a button that says, click me. Below that, it says you've pressed the button zero times. And then there's a couple of hyperlinks. Right? So it's a very simple page that we're looking at. Uh, what does it look like? I've got get it or g edit. What um, it's it's basically the simplest, well, probably not the simplest, but an editing tool in Ubuntu and Unix systems. And you can see the actual main.js, which is the for the most part the sum total of everything we're looking at, is one file, and it's actually really very straightforward. There's a main.html. We've got a template hello created on. Uh, I've got a helper, and I've got an event. So in essence, all I'm doing, and this, this was all there to begin with, the only piece of code I added in addition to what we did with Meteor Create was that start new code, end new code in that one line, console.log, you clicked me. So basically, all it's doing is on the on-click event within the browser, it puts out something in the console. And as you can see, I've also got the browser behind it. You can see I've got the console up there, and you can see you clicked me has happened four times. In effect, I just went clicked on the click me button. And you can also see the number has auto updated. Right. So quite simply, we've gone Meteor Create Simple App. It's created an app from start, from scratch. We've got this app up. I've opened the one main.js file. Um, and uh, and as you can see, I've literally added one line. But right now, this is, in every sense of the word, a full, legit app. Right? It does stuff. You click on it, things happen. Obviously, it doesn't do very much. And we're not looking at it in a particularly useful or interesting way. This is simply, I have an Ubuntu computer. I've followed the instructions so far. Bam. You can see in the actual uh, terminal instance, it's the screenshot of the same one that we had in the last one. If we look at the last slide, it ends at app running at. Here it goes client modified refreshing. Why is it doing that? In essence, I went into main.js, typed in those three lines of code, and went control S. On the control S save, the Meteor framework automatically knows that we've made a change and auto updates whatever's in the browser window for us. Uh, a slightly better, different, if you were doing this in Node, you would use something called Webpack. Some of you may, may not be familiar with it. And in essence, this is the idea. Every time I save it, I don't want to have to run a whole heap of different commands just to get to update in the browser because I'm doing dev work. So as I save, I want this thing to automatically be just refreshing itself. Um, the model here is not bad. 
but it's not particularly great either, right? In this particular case, it works because we've got nothing on. Generally, and we'll go through this a little bit later in the talk when I'm doing some more advanced stuff, but you would normally have preprocessors of a number of varieties. You would have CSS preprocessors, which is your style sheets and all of that. So your app looks good. We're also going to go into a little bit later for more advanced stuff. JavaScript is officially at sort of ES5, which is the standard, give or take. ES6 is basically uh, the 2016 version. ES5 was the 2015 version. Every year, the people who run JavaScript in aggregate add new stuff to it. ES7 is the 2017 standard, and there's a process. So what happens is as we're adding new stuff into the JavaScript language, before it's formalized, people get a chance to test it, which means you can do ES7 plus type coding uh, in the ES2015, and we use Babel precompilers and things like that. The last bit didn't make a lot of sense to you. Don't worry about it. It's, you know, I'm trying to cover both sides of, uh, of the sort of experience here. So this is something called Atom. This is the exact same thing as the simple app that we just created. It's just that I'm looking at it in what's called, a, I wouldn't go as far as to say this is an IDE, but in effect, the idea is some sort of integrated development environment. Does Atom do a lot of the things full-fledged IDEs do, like um, Xcode or uh, Visual Studio, its latest versions? Absolutely not. It's completely open source and all of that. This is free to download and you can play with it. That being said, it does do a whole heap and the level of customization that you can do in things like Atom will absolutely blow you away. So on my dev PC, for instance, I have customization related to treating JavaScript files as ES7 plus with precompilers in there and the linting and the highlighting and all of that, it all just works. Because a bunch of the stuff you can do is experimental. The, the sort of model that you know, uh, Microsoft or Apple have, which is these big centralized IDEs with big centralized SDKs and, you know, an entire cloud sort of platform. It kind of doesn't exist, so we get to do a lot of this stuff by hand from scratch. On the plus side, this is all free, so, you know. Um, what I'm going to do now is open up Atom and look at something a little bit more complex. What I'd like you to focus on is the bit that I've got opened up. You can see there's a file structure there. What you need to think of this file structure is it's in essence exactly the same as uh, as that, right? So that's the file structure for full app. You've got client server dot meteor, which is the actual compiled files. It's basically the same thing except on steroids. So we've got client, we've got import, we've got public, we've got server, and we've got some tests. Does that make sense to everyone? Client, server, these are the two sides of the app that we're gonna be playing with. This is just a fancier version of that. Uh, one of the fun things about Meteor, I didn't actually build any of this. There was a fantastic guy called Meteor Chef, and basically there's a number of efforts within the Meteor and JavaScript community to build a base model for more complex apps. This is really good because it means we have to code less. I'm going to run this in a second and I'm going to show you what it looks like. But before that, let's just have a quick look at what's, at what's happening. Okay, so when a client sort of logs in or when, when you run your Meteor app, what's actually happening is it's going to start up and going to client there. And you can see there's an index.js and a roots.js. What are we talking about in roots? Roots are fundamentally, and you can see root name documents, blah, blah, blah. These are fundamentally the equivalent of pages, right? So instead of creating a website that has hyperlinks, we're going to be using JavaScript both on client side and server side to make these up. In essence, all the roots are just pages, right? Think of it in terms of that. What we've got is a single page app. Um, this one is more focused on actually showing you the different pages. We'll go through a one. The last one that we look at will have effectively you know, one page 
and all the functionality in it. But that's kind of where we're building to. To start with, we have a web app with a couple of different pages and routes in that. And the routes themselves are fairly um, self-explanatory, I guess. Uh, root path, that is, in effect, the root right there. Um, when, I, when I highlight, can you guys see what's going on? When I highlight like a line or something? Cool. Uh, index root. Index, you know, as, as, as you would. There's some documents, there's some new document, there's an edit document view. And these are all slightly different. And, and if you're familiar at all with the website of stuff for developing, document slash new is the path you would go to for the new document. If you're familiar with PHP or just HTML and using the JavaScript just on client side, it's actually pretty similar. It's just that we're going to do some cool stuff in the back end to give you a couple of options that you don't normally have. Uh, login, recover password, reset password, sign up. Again, these are very standard requirements that every app give or take needs, right? You need to be able to log in. You need to be able to have some sort of user control. Groups, uh, you need to be able to log out if someone forgets their password, all of that, right? And that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, what's happening on the server side? On the server side, again, I've got index. And index is just the sort of, this is where we start. That's how servers, applications, everything goes. What we're doing here is a little bit different, though. Within the server, what we're doing is we're importing a bunch of files and folders. Why are we importing this? What we're telling the Meteor service to do is when you start building your app, load all this stuff. It's basically all it is. I'll go over them really quickly. Accounts email templates is what the email templates look like when we send out emails. So let's just have a quick look at them. If we go accounts, email templates, and you can see, you know, there's a bunch of stuff around it, but the key part is basically this, right? That's what an email template would look like. This gets auto-generated. We have public and private keys. We can hook it up to something like SendGrid or MailChimp, and it'll just work straight out of the box, right? It means you don't need to spend time building password resets, simply because this stuff is actually quite important from a security perspective and therefore quite easy to do badly. And more importantly, there's an entire community of people who are doing it that are all using the exact same thing. Therefore, patching and security type issues become a lot simpler quickly, just because it's open source, there's a lot of people interested in it, and, and most of these people are, you know, security is obviously a massive concern. Um, fixtures. Now, in case you've ever wondered, and this is again from a startup point, when you build an app, how do you seed the database that sits behind it, right? How do you start up as a person? How do you give it that first user so you can log in and start creating things? It's called a fixture, right? Much like tables, you know, they have fixtures. So we upload the fixtures straight away. And you can see, I have used a classically useful username and password, admin at admin.com and password, right? Now, as soon as we log in for the first time, the smart thing to do is to delete that. Really, you don't want to leave that up there. But to start with, it actually works really well. Uh, name, random person, roles, admin. What's that little square box? I mean, obviously, it's an array, but why are we doing that? The base that I've started with already has a full roles, groups, all that, right? The calls to change those around are fairly straightforward. So we don't need to build that. It's all. In you know, it's all sort of centered around. Let's just get this up and running really, really quickly. And so is all this code, is all this code still what was automatically generated from the original command? No, it was what I downloaded from base, which is one of the various sort of add-ons. The original command was the Meteor in it, which just did that first little thing that you saw with the click me thing. All of this is a base download. Uh, base is free, it's open source, it's just a couple of guys keep an entire simple, simple single page application available. You can download this off Git. Uh, I should, um, let's go to it. Meet your boilerplate. That's the command. Right, so that's all I did. 
quite literally. Obviously, I didn't put in project name. I put in you know, whatever simple app, whatever that project was. Um, but that's effectively all there is to it. You just go do that, then you run Meteor NPM install, and that's a full app. So instead of doing just straight up Meteor create whatever, we're taking someone else's standardized base model, and we're simply building that. That's that's all we're doing. Um, all this fixture stuff is actually in there, straight from scratch. It's all just, you know, the idea is you want to have your first app up in five, 10 minutes after the install. Uh, fixtures make sense to everyone. You can obviously complicate this quite a bit more, but in essence, we've got databases. The general model I would use for something like this, which you're going to see in 15 minutes or so, is a hosted MongoDB database, which sits as a separate service. And this basically seeds all your collections. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you've got a database. Within the database, you generally have a user. And then you have collections. Your collections are basically schemas. Uh, and, and we'll get into what a schema looks like in a second. But we're basically seeding our database so that we can start playing with it. Uh, I'm not really going to go into browser policy. API is a little bit interesting. And if we look at API, all it is is importing a publication and uh, a methods. What is API documents, though, fundamentally? What are we looking at? Let's go have a quick squiz at it. So that's my API folder right there, and that's documents. So if we look at documents, there's a bunch of stuff. This, this is what a schema looks like, right? All it is is you've got a title and you've got a body. It is type document. And if you create more of these documents, they're going to have a title and a body each. And we're going to look at that. I'm doing some other interesting things here. Uh, I've got import factory up there for somewhat more advanced people. It means you can use these factory.define type commands to seed your database with large amounts of information. You would generally use this on load testing or integration testing or whatever. Um, and all I'm doing is I'm creating a new Mongo collection. Mongo is a database setup, not a different SQL. And then I'm attaching this schema to my Mongo collection. That's all it is. Once we've got this, server and publications is simply we're creating two flows of information, because keep in mind this is on the server side, from the server to the client. Right? These are our two folders. We're always server, client. Server is sort of our side. Client is what's going to get downloaded onto the user's browser. And that's what they're going to interact with. And in effect, the flow from server to client is what these publications look like. Um, that was all fun, and it kind of was. But let's go actually and look at it. What I've done in this case is I've just uploaded it really quickly. Uh, this is a new laptop, and I don't really know how to run these on Windows. That was, yeah. Um, Whatever. OK, so this is what the app actually looks like. This is the one that was straight off downloaded off the internet. I made. Uh, on this one, I actually didn't make any changes. And this is what it looks like. As you can see, it's uh, what is hosting it. It's hosted on Meteor Galaxy. And this is free. That's sort of the how those guys make money. They sell you the ability to host an app. Uh, this is in the sandbox, so it is free. I'm also using something called MLab to host my MongoDB. That's also sandbox. It's all going to be a little bit slow, but this is all free, and I literally put the container up a second ago. Um, from our fixtures, we know it was admin at admin.com and password, so hopefully this will work. Uh, you can see for something that's come straight off the internet and I've done bug it all with. It actually doesn't look too bad, right? We're using something called uh, Bootstrap at the behind of this to sort of give it some frameworks and things like that. I personally don't use Bootstrap very much myself, uh, but this is what it uses. And, and it gives you some really nice stuff, right? So let's just have a quick look at what this looks like in code. We went to the root, obviously, and then it sort of went there, right? At that point, it immediately went to login. Why did it go to login? Because the index root, which is our basic thing, of got on enter authenticate, right? What's that say? As soon as it gets to the base, you have to authenticate. To authenticate, we've got to go to the login. That's literally how that 
name login path login got us to here. Um, give me one second, because what I'd like to show you, uh, just to go back for a second, what does our primary HTML page look like? As you can see, really not very much. That's the exciting part, right? That's literally what's happening there. What does our main.html JS look like? This is what gets loaded with main.html. Again, squad, but it's telling it to go to the startup and go to client, and that's how we started. Does that kind of make sense in what the flow looked like on the browser's side? Uh, what happens after that? I have. We use primarily imports and UI. Startup is obviously startup. Modules is a bunch of stuff that is not generally going to be front end. It's going to be encapsulated behavior that might be useful in any and all places. API is where my schemas, collections, and the functions related to that sit. Uh, let's look at UI. UI goes to layout, app. What's an app look like? This doesn't tell me a huge amount, but what it does tell me is there's an app navigation, a grid, and the grid has children, right? Let's just follow that through quickly and have a look at app navigation. I'm doing some interesting stuff here, and this is primarily taking those publications that we used and putting it in. But in essence, it looks like this. You can see navbar, navbar head, brand, link, application name. What am I looking at? Navbar, application name, sign up and login. Navbar collapse, render navigation. What is render navigation? If has user, if a user is logged in, show authenticated navigation. If the user is not logged in, show public navigation. Right now, we're not logged in, so public navigation. Let's go quickly look at public navigation. Uh, sign up and login. Link contain nav item and nav item. Sign up, login. Does that kind of make sense in terms of how these pieces are coming together? The whole idea is let's take a piece, let's break it down continually, and then build it back up. So every little thing is, at the end of the day, a React component that's doing one very specific thing. Why do we do this? One of the major problems with older bits of code like PHP were it was scripted, right? So it was basically spaghetti code, and you had no idea what was going on after a while. PHP. You know, I can say this about PHP because obviously it came out in the late 90s, so stuff has happened since then. But even with PHP frameworks like Laravel and things like that, getting nice, simple, really simple, testable components so you knew they wouldn't break when they do strange and unusual things, that's the whole point, right? That's why we take a component, we keep breaking it down to the smallest little bit that we can, and then we have a small piece of code that we can test quite nicely. One of the reasons you know you see so many files and all of that is it's explicitly broken up into really little bits, so people like me, you know, who get confused easily, can can get like it's just too much to remember. Why bother? You know, just make it nice, make it small, test it, document it. Once you have your test cases, when it breaks, write another test so that you know. Breaking it in the future, it's not going to break the same way. And that's basically a web dev cycle. Um, really quickly, I'm going to show you what the login page looked like. And as you can see, it's basically form control stuff, right? So form control email, password, some stuff about the email and the password, and that's what that looks like. This is what it is. Literally downloaded off the guy, ran it. Have made absolutely no changes. As you can see, we've got a little app here, right? Uh, I'm going to go through random person. Remember, our seed user. That was that was the name we gave him, random person. Uh, we can obviously log out. Uh, we've got index, which doesn't really do very much, and we've got this documents thing, which doesn't really do very much either at the moment. But hang on, doesn't it? Because I've got an entire sort of MongoDB and all of that sitting in, this is just purely a simple container that I've put up. Let's have a quick look at this documents page and this new document. All I really want you to take away from this is how we've broken it up into really small pieces and we deal with each piece individually. Okay, documents. 
this is the documents page. How do we know that? Our root says this is the document page slash documents. And remember again, authenticate on enter. So we can't get to it, uh, you know, unless you're a registered user and all of that. Um, what does it look like? Documents, there's a button, pull right, class name, pull right, BS style, button, all of, all of this comes from Bootstrap, which is a publicly available, very well vetted library of how to start, uh, how, how to stick front end controls in a place, right? What's happening? Uh, class name documents, that's the start of the page. I do a row and a column, so I give it a grid of some variety. I can control what's happening. Documents, I've got this new, and look, all it is href documents new. I go to the page that knows how to handle the new document. What does that look like? Like so. We've got new document button, and then I have this thing called documents list. Documents list is what all of this is going to be. Again, we're importing it from somewhere else, and a lot of stuff is happening. But again, encapsulate it, make it nice, make it testable, move it aside. Right? And that's what we're putting in here. If we look at documents list, um, where is documents list? It's a container, it's doing some stuff, whatever. Um, I'm going to show you how to create a new document really quickly. Hopefully, this will all work. Right? That's literally all there is to it. We go look at documents again here. One of the things you're going to see is I'm still using quite a bit of sort of links here, right? So I'm going from this page to that page to this page to that page. And that's all fine, but towards, you know, when we go through these examples, you're going to look at these versions that basically don't really need links. And it is a very, very fluid experience from the point of view of the client. That's sort of where we want to get it to. Slightly, um, uh, yeah, so that, that, that's sort of, yeah. <coughs> the one other thing I wanted to cover here is ESLint. ESLint is what? Linting. The idea of linting is I want to write my code a specific way. I want to write my code in a way that's enforceable across an organization, right? Because you want effectively the same coding styles. And it helps errors not creep in. Do you see this little ESLint error no console? That's not an actual error. That's just ESLint telling me an error because I have a rule in there somewhere that says uh, no console co comments, right? What does ESLint look like? Yes, link looks like so. Uh, environment browser common ES6 true. You can see what I've got here is a couple of plugins, right? These are the plugins that are recommended the ESLint normal JavaScript recommended. That's pretty much everyone using JavaScript. Uh, React has their own. And so Facebook is recommending that when you use React, you use it with a bunch of basically grammar styles so it's simpler to understand. Right? This is how we start to look at code quality and start to write code that isn't terrible. Meteor, again, Meteor has its own guide and says when you're using Meteor, I can, you know, there's basically a bunch of things. You can get rid of them, but in effect, you can see the rules themselves are quite simple. Quotes, what kind of quotes do you like? I'd like only single quotes. That's what that's saying. Uh, what, you know, around errors, this is sort of indentation. So all my code will automatically just be indented to two and two. Uh, the switch cases, I think that was something I was doing random. Uh, in a switch, the way you code it in an ES6 plus, so that's just a straight up switch case statement. Uh, the linter wasn't working for some reason, so I scored that off stack overflow. Yep. So what's enforcing this ES lint? Is that Atom that's enforcing That is, that? absolutely. Um, absolutely. So the Atom editor is enforcing Absolutely. That. So the way you would look at it, and I don't have it set up here, but you've got this config.json, which is within Atom itself, right? Uh, it's telling me that, you know, this is my user ID, so when Atom crashes, the thing will tell the people who make Atom how to do stuff. 
And again, you've got um, in settings, a very large number of settings that you can set up here. This is stuff around the editor. Packages, there's hundreds and hundreds of packages to Atom. So when you get Atom, you generally also download whatever particular um, you know, language you're coding in. Linters around that, error checking stuff around that. Basically coding style stuff. So that's what I just want you to remember that if, if you're going to take it away. For ESLint, we'd like to code better going forward. That's all there is to it. Let's look. So is ES, ESLint then a, a plugin for Atom? Um, is it a, no. A style of configuration ESLint, is, Atom uh, ESLint is actually, so much like JSDoc, or um, you would run an ESLint on, uh, on an entire project, and that would create files which tell you all your errors. Now you can take a subset of that ESLint, plug it into Atom, and instead of having to create a file that tells you all the errors, it'll just show it to you in the GUI so you can correct it in line. But most of the stuff is very, very plug and play. Um, that, that's essentially it that I want to show you on the base downloaded thing. right? So this is our first, first go at it. What we're going to do now is make it a little bit more complicated and look at effectively the same base download, but I'm going to add in a couple of new styling stuff, and we're going to make it look a little bit different and you know, change around the uh, products that we're using just a tad. What we're going to be using is something called Material UI. Um, Material UI is basically something I think Google came up with, uh, and it's basically a bunch of standards on how to make things look right. Why is this complex? Because people access the internet with lots of different devices. And most of these things don't look particularly nice in one device or the other. The ideas can be standardized so we don't have to rewrite the code several times. Uh, how successful has this been? Honestly, eh? what people have found is you can write the same app, effectively this app, and it will run on all applications. It just doesn't do it particularly nicely. Meteor, for instance, has something called Cordova, and when you write it in that style, you know, basically, much like we did Meteor Create, at the end of your app, you deploy for iOS and you deploy for Android, and suddenly you don't need to write any more code, and you have a web app, an Android app, and an iOS app. This sounded really good in theory, and for, you know, for a large, for a lot of it, it actually does work very well. The thing is, as Android changes, as the iOS stack changes, it never quite just works exactly the way you'd like it to. Uh, I think the community at large is moving away and gone just bugger it, make different apps because it's far too hard. How much of a problem is this? Not that much. Uh, in the old days, you would be like, don't put too much on your server because you get load, you know, server load would increase quite quickly. Not so much of a problem. These days, put more stuff on the server because at the end of the day, vertical and horizontal <coughs> scaling on the server side is something you control. The device the user is coming into, coming to your website with, who knows, right? You have no idea what chipset it's running. You have no idea what OS it's running. It's just getting harder and harder to manage that side. And it's cheaper and easier than ever before to scale on this side of the fence. So we keep bringing in more stuff on the server side. The client becomes very, very thin. So now when you need to write effectively new apps per you know, uh, Android, or iOS, or just a normal web app, uh, that, that becomes simpler. I should point out that off the same uh, sort of example of Android and iOS, and this is again a little bit more advanced, if you're working with JavaScript, what you can do is something called Electron that is part of Node. And in effect, it's a desktop app. You just write it in HTML and CSS. You don't worry about the underlying deploy. It just gets all handled by Node and sort of JavaScript and all of that. What this means is if you're just a web guy, you can suddenly build desktop apps that work really well, right? So, so sort of boundaries blurring, and you can start mucking around quite a bit. Um, Material UI is Um, actually, Material UI so came from Google's Material Design. Material UI is basically a bunch of React components that a uh, that a web web dev house in the UK simply put together, and then they open sourced it because generally you get a lot better feedback, testing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
And these are what the components look like. So you can see there's a bunch of components here that I can use. This is all just straight out. And I don't need to muck around with building the front end because you know what? I really don't understand CSS all that well. I'm not good at it. It looks freaking terrible. It's take stuff that other people have done. They're, you know, it's it's really quite straightforward. Let's have a look at what sorry. What, what program is that? That's part of the media or tracking tool. Material UI? This this uh, the UI. The, these applications. Yeah. This is all just Material UI. It's just an open source library of React components that's based on Material guidelines, which is in effect a set of guidelines that Google came up with for how to make stuff look, you know, relatively similar across device. So it was basically a bunch of graphics guys came together and said, "This is what front end components should look like." Someone took that, uh, coded it up in React, and we get to use it. And I'm going to show you basically how to use all this in the exact same base thing. Uh, yes, I have actually. This is my deploy. Um, deploy is you click on it and you hit the start button. These are all on different databases, so it actually doesn't matter that in effect. It is a little bit slow, sandbox, all of that. They turn it off when no one uses it. Here you can see it's fundamentally the same thing. I've just changed the front end. Is that, when you look at it, this, this is sort of, can you see the similarity to the old one? I've actually left in the login bit with the bootstrap based stuff. So you can see this is sort of a halfway house, right? Um, and again, application name. Uh, let's, let's look at the code really quickly. And you can see this is now what we're looking at. So this is the base material, right? All I've made is a couple of changes in that I'm taking bits of Bootstrap, which is the front end that came with base out, and I'm putting bits of material UI, which is this newfangled fancy front end in. Um, with all of this, oh, this is probably the old stuff. With all of this, you can see that the vast majority of the app is completely unchanged, right? Remember, we downloaded an app that we can create new documents in, and the vast majority of it is actually unchanged. The only place I'm really making changes is sort of there. If we look at this stuff, index.js, it's going to look a little bit different. So you can see I've got some raised buttons here. I've got a card header, all the stuff we didn't have in the old base one. But that's what we're going to go away and look at now. I'm pretty sure I seeded it with the exact same uh, You can see that forgot password has moved around. Uh, it was a little bit more that side. Hang on. Is the entire thing just I think that the right hand side is yeah, kind of can't. Okay. Let's try. Yes. Yes, that's all of it. So, much like we had sign up and login, I've changed it just a tad. Right? That's all there is to it. All I'm doing is I've taken the exact same backend stuff. I've just flipped out, flipped around the 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 front end view bit. Right. And this is all just open source stuff. Yeah. Again, really similar to uh, I, I did all of this this morning, just to give you an idea. Like it took Two and a half hours, and most of that was mucking around with this computer because I can install stuff on it. So, in terms of actually the changes I've made, they're very trivial. But you can see straight off the back, we've got a lot of stuff that you know we've got an entire thing that we can start sticking business logic into, which is hopefully going to be uh, your value proposition for whatever you're trying to do. Um, some cool stuff. I'm using the card here, right? This is all just material UI. I didn't code any of it. I have no idea how it works underlined. It's just that. Uh, I've got two buttons here. They both go to the exact same place. This is just one style of document. This is a different style of document. Let's look at that. Uh, do you see how I've got two raised buttons here? The only line of difference that I actually coded was that secondary is equal to true. And that, that's the primary color. That's the secondary color. 
that's all there is to it, right? Um, and in a happy coincidence, we can actually go to button, look at raise button, and they will tell us how to do stuff. Google is your friend, or um, you know, DuckDuckGo or Bing or whatever you know, floats your boat. Uh, I did a couple of other things here. Uh, I changed that around just a tad. But for the most part, I've kept it really quite straightforward. It's the exact same thing, just in a little bit different. Let's look at documents now. And you can see, again, the, the functionality is the same. All I'm doing is going to that route that we created originally. And we've got documents. I've got this new, that's a slightly different kind of button. Again, it looks fairly schmick for really not very much work at all. And that's kind of what we're going for. I mean, you know, you, you don't want to overthink things and you don't want to build things because you have fun building them. You want nice, reusable, testable components uh, with, you know, ideally lots of other people also using them because that way errors and stuff get picked up very, very quickly. Uh, if I look at... That's the entire thing on GitHub. And as you can see, there's a lot of commits, there's a bunch of branches, 634 issues. You know, a lot of people are putting time into this. Most of it is all around using ES6, ES7 plus, you know, Babel recompiles and things like that. Don't worry about it. I've run into them occasionally. Uh, I think when Facebook went up a React version, every now and then something will break. They'll fix it pretty quickly. Uh, how do you patch it? You go to Meteor and you go Meteor NPM update and it does it. Uh, you want to be a little bit careful around this, especially if you're mucking around with different node versions. Things will start to break. But when you're doing it quite simply, this is all I want. It's fairly straightforward. This is actually a really good sort of, when you look at the number of issues, pull requests, projects, you know this is being worked on, right? Uh, if you've never really used GitHub before, you can see a whole bunch of stuff is happening, right? This means people are working on it. So in essence, your components just keep getting better without you having to do anything, which all things considered is a pretty good outcome for something I downloaded for free. Um, new document. So you can see what I've done here quite literally is I've taken the bit of code we had in the old one, and all I've done is stuck this little box thing around it, which pops it up a little bit, and it looks a little bit different. You wouldn't generally do this. You would, you know, you would switch to all the material UI components, so you'd their text fields and all of that. The reason I've sort of left it this halfway house is so you can see that's basically the same thing. Um, with terms of code, that's what it looks like. It's not that different. That first bit is that cancel button, which is, again, the same button component we were using now. The other bit is basically this paper thing and a card, right? What's paper and card doing? The card is doing this for me. And the paper is sort of the little highlight. You know, I'm just using it as a box. Again, that's what a card looks like. And they helpfully tell you how to write code with it. Would that work if you were offline? No, because fundamentally all of this is actually somewhat hilariously, if you did actually stop the server, all the little UI bits would work because they have downloaded and they're in your browser. What would work is less the app, rest of the app because it's fundamentally, this is fundamentally a website, right? There's only so much I can do with it. If it was Electron or something like that, yeah, it would. You could build in that stuff. But this is fundamentally a website, right? It's not. It's not an actual. You can always run this website locally on the laptop. Yeah, I was just wondering about that. Um, you could, but you'd use something called. Um, depends on what you're trying to do, right? You you could put all of this stick it into an Electron app, and then it would work like a native desktop app. Um, but, but this is a website, so that, that's kind of... I was just wondering if the, that facility of having something offline temporarily, so you lose connection or something, sure. things still work on the client side? Yeah, they do. 
Um, let me talk about how for a second. It's, it's a little bit more complex, but so what we do to do server client connectivity basically is we've got these things called publications, right? And that was here, like so. What's happening in the background and you probably, it'll make sense in the next version is, does that, anyone know what an uplog is? Yes, no, maybe? No? Uh, databases have things like uplogs. Uplog is operations log. So Mongo, which is the database we're using, and for anyone who cares, it's a NoSQL database. Why? Because they're easier to work with than SQL databases. And I'm working in a startup, so we're really not that fussed about you know SQL migrations and sort of making sure that our migration is happy and all of that. It's you know it's just a slightly different use case. Mongo has an uplog, and what Meteor is doing is, and I'll get into it just sort of in, in a couple of minutes. But it's specifically doing something called uplog tailing. So Meteor looks at the Mongo database. Mongo's uplog keeps track of all the changes that have happened in the, Meteor, in the Mongo database. Meteor watches so, and when the uplog changes, Meteor automatically re-renders the underlying component. And you'll see it in terms of uh, probably on, on, on the next one where you, know, you, you can actually see it work in terms of um, in, 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 like you'll see what I mean, and this is sort of the magic of why we use these things. It's because you don't you want it to straight up be reactive, right? You don't really want to be clicking around on websites and things like that. There's different challenges, and we'll get into that when I talk about state in a second. Uh, but let's, let me finish this super quick, and then I'll get. You you can uh, is is the long and short, I guess. Does that kind of make sense in terms of uh, what we were looking at? So I go cancel, this goes back and forth. You can see all I'm doing is triggering on-click events. Where is these on-clicks and things like that coming from? That's just HTML, right? And your browser. HTML in your browser has on-clicks, on-mouse hovers, pretty much any kind of thing that's happening. You track that and you do stuff with it. So is everyone comfortable with that? All I did was make a bunch of changes. It looks shinier now with fairly little effort on my, my side. Okay, so how does this work in real time? And this is the answer to your question. But while we're at it, so this obviously I've been working on for a little bit longer. Um, this is where you deploy it within Galaxy. I'm going to shut down the first two just to show you what it looks like. Am I stopping the correct one? Yes. How do you deploy? You click that start button. A bunch of logs. This is the actual server that all this stuff is happening on. I really don't care for the most part, right? All I'm doing is saying, ping, a little bit of money. They give me a couple of containers. This is all sandbox, which is why it was a little bit slow. Containers being stopped, that's basically all that is to it. The build and deploy command is actually one line. Keep in mind, this is just, we're deploying a single page app. You, it would get a lot more complex in production simply because you would normally have prod UAT staging. You know, you may, may not have other stuff happening around. Uh, you probably have, depending on one of the downsides of deploy, deploying to the cloud, like Galaxy, is you don't have a public sort of area, which means when you want to save files, save images, you're just saving it in maybe in AWS or DigitalOcean. You probably have a couple of Nginx servers, kind of beyond what we're doing here today. But the core deploy is literally one line that you actually save in your package. Um, where did I save it? That's the actual command. Um, I'm just doing that so you can see it. 
But to run that in my terminal, I basically go uh, npm run staging. That's the entire deploy. Why? Because deploying stuff is hard. Look at that. There's, there's heaps of arguments and stuff like that. I don't want to be remembering that stuff, right? Because mostly it'll confuse me. Um, and you can see production is obviously a little bit different. What I'm telling it to do here actually is use. So in the root, you would normally have something called settings.development, settings.production being good sort of behavior. When I stuck this into Git, which is a repository system that some of you may or may not be aware of, you generally stick these into the Git ignore. Why? Because I don't want to put my private keys for all these things into a repository, right? Not worth it. Someone will hack you, bad things will happen. They'll charge up a big, big bill to you. Right, so that's why I've kept it out. But in essence, there's this settings.development, settings underscore development .json file, and that's what we're using. That's where, say, MailChimp settings, right? We want to send emails. All that stuff is going to be there. It's just all going to be basically a bunch of keys. So you key to talk to AWS, whatever you want. Uh, we're going to look at this app four thing now, but before that, I just want to talk about this really quickly. Um, real time stack. What's going to happen is we publish stuff and it'll work really quickly and we'll use this thing called uplog tailing. Off the back of the uplog tailing, Meteor knows which bit of the app to re render, and that's how the real time stuff happens. Does that kind of make sense in terms of? How are we making it seem like stuff is happening? Um, before I get to the JS doc stuff, let's actually show you what we can do with this. So that's quite similar. Again, I started with that basic thing. Then I made a bunch of changes. Obviously, in this version, that's what it looks like because I took out all the base components and put in all the material UI components. All right, so that's what an application looks like. Now, here's what we can do that's fun. We can go there, we can go there. You know, we can uh, create new directories. Did you see that slight delay before the cheese appeared? That's because it's sandbox. But what's basically happening is a very large number of bits of data are being uh, Push down by a publish. This is happening at the database level. <clears throat> the uplog is being tailed by Meteor, and it goes, oh, hang on, there's some more stuff in the database. Let me go re-render the component that shows you what's happening there. And this happens in the front end. So, you know, uh, I can create a new file. I've got it set to do some stuff. Slide delay again. But as soon as you start playing with this, you realize that you don't have to be in this world where clicking on stuff means going from root to root to root, right? Which is fundamentally what you're doing in a Rails app or generally an HTML app. Right, at this point, it's like, you know, this is like this is a website and I'm just playing with it. And it's this reactivity, this ability to publish lots of information downstream quite quickly and then make it a seamless experience for the user that's sort of where single page apps are going fundamentally. Uh, if I look at my test doco, I've got some stuff here. That's some um, content title, all that stuff. Right, that's obviously Laura Nipson. Yeah, I'm gonna go control Z. Does that kind of make sense that I can go control B for a bold, control I for italics? Right. What's happening here? This is actually quite cool because what I've done, and this is one of the reasons to use React, that's actually something called Draft.js. Actually, that component is the, you know how you update your status in Facebook, the little box? That's basically Draft.js. Literally taken that component, Facebook has very kindly open sourced it, 
with the added caveat that if you try to sue them, they can take a, take that away from you. But and it's just that. So you know, you don't have to worry about text editors. Just go use the one those guys are using. Why? Because it's good tested code. Behind the scenes, what's happening? And this is again a little bit more advanced. Uh, this is a little bit more advanced. It's actually a Redux store. We use something called immutable. So we create immutable states of this entire thing. So the text being bolded, being italicized, all of that, just moving back and forth through these different immutable states, it saves it. And at the end of it, I've got it the on change event, go away and save it in the database. So it all just becomes one seamless little thing. Is this all uh, responsive that look the same across a, a, an iPhone, an Android? Yeah, so this is a website. This is not an actual, like, I mean. I know it's not an app. Yeah. But on a, on a phone, it would look. Uh, no, it looks slightly different because I'm using McKinsey. So one of the things I've got in here is um, this thing called Simple Grid. So when Bootstrap first came on, I think Bootstrap was maybe Twitter. Yeah, I think it was Twitter Bootstrap. What's the problem? We need a row column gridding system, right? Said row column gridding system needs to work cross device. This was Bootstrap's spiel, right? That, that's what they started with. So when it got coded into React, we saw those exact same things. Uh, In Bootstrap, this looks like, oh, no, there isn't. This is it in Bootstrap, right? Jumbotron. That's like your standard Bootstrap 101, the little bar thing that comes across that says blah. So, so that was where it started. Um, once you move to stuff like Material UI, where everything's React component, I don't actually need all of Bootstrap anymore. In essence, all I need is a gridding system, right? I'm just using Simple Grid. Again, open source, all it is, it's not going to give you, you know, page highlights. There's no H1, H2, H3, none of that stuff, because we don't need any of that and we don't care. All we need is a gridding system. What do we do with the gridding system? That's how it would work as you know, the same on any uh, on any device, because you're looking at a web page with a gridding system. Uh, this specific um, this specific stuff, how well, well will it work? Probably not that well, because this isn't really intended for use on uh, on cross device. But in effect, because it's sitting in simple grid, it'll just fit itself out. So you this that library sort of thing, that bit there, will go on top because that's my first two columns of my math. This, the remainder of this paper component, which is this box or this, will sort of come one down. Does that kind of make sense in terms of, so will it? Yeah. Will it? Well, I haven't particularly, I, I, I wouldn't recommend this style of app. You could absolutely make apps where you wouldn't have this nav bar to the right and all this other stuff. And those would work pretty much seamlessly. Uh, again, if you're doing it for mobile stuff, you want to try and move more and more to server, right? And, and I'll show you what that looks like in code versus putting it back and forth. We're running a little bit more than time. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm actually going fairly reasonable on time also. A uh, couple other things, similar sort of model, right? Um, in this case, I can click on that and I can do stuff like, I'd like to give myself a couple of actions while I've already done that. Let's do it in something else. Now I've got those actions there. So that kind of makes sense in terms of how you can basically create. This is a tree structure, by the way. This root thing is basically just a tree structure with an area folder sitting underneath it. That's all it is. And then I'm putting in, uh, let's look at it. That 
that, that's basically what it looks like, right? So we've got a library, library name, a bunch of stuff around the library, you know, actions, whatever, whatever. But it all comes down to the fact that um, it has library docs and uh, folders, lib folders, folder schema. That's it. That piece of code right there is everything that's sitting behind my files and folders mimic, right? Because that's where it is. The folder has a name and it has some data. All I'm doing is traversing this stuff back and forth. And the way I'm doing it is stuff like this. Right? I just create a store. It has current item, current location. And then I just traverse the tree. This is CS101, right? Go up and down this tree structure that does certain things. Incidentally, in this particular one, I've also got like roles and roots. So what you're looking at there is actually sort of a grouping system and some other stuff. Right? But, but I'm, I'm not saying it's trivial. I'm just trying to show you what, what you can do with it. Um, that was kind of what I wanted to show you there. Uh, what else have we got? JS doc. So how do you document this stuff, right? Because as you can obviously tell, there's a whole heap of stuff that's going on. It's pretty easy to forget. I just use stuff like that, JS doc. So here I've got function, add user, object user. So it needs a parameter of a user and returns a promise. If we have time and if anyone cares, I'll talk about promises. And off the back of running, basically, that kind of uh, thing, I get this, right? So I can create an entire file structure that tells me about all my functions, all my, how have I organized it on the code side? Much as we have, let's look at the users because it's fairly obvious. I simply have a bunch of get helpers, right? Different properties of the user that I'm looking at with some code. Right, so it's all, you have get helpers, you have set helpers, you can insert stuff. It's fairly sort of standardized kind of thing. Um, testing, again, you can run entire test sets and that's what test sets look like. Let's have a look at helpers.tests. We set up on server. We reset the database beforehand. And then this is basically what test looks like. It, add function, add user. This is me putting that. And the assert type of assert equal. This is what testing looks like. Right? I create a function. I give it a fake object. I say, give me this particular piece of information about said fake object. And then I check that fake object's information equals what my function is returning. So every single one of the get helpers, the set helpers, the insert helpers, he just tests it. You can also do this to the UI components. I'm not going to get into that, especially with that fancy one, because I'm using something called MobX. It's an ES7 plus, and you know, I take ES7 code, so code that isn't in real JavaScript and is in JavaScript two years from now. I use something called a Babel compiler to recompile it into 2015, because they're all backwards compatible, and then I run it. So it does get more complex in terms of we use preprocessors and things like that. But fundamentally, that's all there is to something like testing, right? Take, you know, start with a super basic thing, find every little thing that you want, break it into the smallest component you can, do a UI test on the back end. All it should do is do a get helper or a set helper or something like that, and have that flow through. Uh, yeah, so it totally goes. That is it for me. Thank you for listening. Hopefully that was not the word. Questions? Uh, any questions? <clears throat> um, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, it'll be quick. Uh, in one of the uh, JavaScript files, you had this um, like sort of XML, HTML-ish markup. Sure. Embedded in your functions, can you elaborate on what's, what that's called? So, so basically, what's happening is it's called a JSX file, right? JSX. So it's a JavaScript extended. Um, again, Atom. I'm lazy, and the difference between JS files for pure JavaScript and JSX files for 
JavaScript with bits of HTML encoded into it, I didn't care. So I told my Atom browser to treat all JS files and compile them all as JSX. What's actually happening, let's look at a simple example. So, so for example, you had a Jumbotron, Jumbotron uh, example there. Sure. Like so? So do you have the, so do the uh, camel case, sorry, sorry, like the flat button, does that expand into like uh, div, div space class equals blah, 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 or something like that? No, when it gets compiled into a full JS thing, because okay. it gets compiled and then the compiler gets uploaded, okay. it all happens there. It also gets minimal. Minified and you know all the other stuff. Okay. So yes, you're right. So the way React is working is they take HTML, CSS, create effectively a shadow version of that. Okay. You only manipulate the shadow, okay. and React will force it through to the main browser. Okay. So I, you, you're right. That's exactly what's happening. But in practice, I'm never aware of it. Okay. If, if if that kind of makes sense. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned you're working for a startup, and you've obviously done a whole ton of work on this. Um, how critical has you know, the Node.js Meteor stuff been versus uh, another micrologging framework in terms of delivering results for your startup? Sure. Um, massively. Uh, without, without getting into too much detail, it's basically uh, a multilingual content management system. Right. We started out doing stuff on the Python side because we've got a bunch of natural language processing going on. And the idea was, how do you then create effectively, instead of a website, a cluster of websites in say five, 10 languages? Right. This, this, this was the problem. Um, we, we looked at Python, and because that's kind of where we started at. Python 2.7, uh, which is what most of Python is, cannot handle internationalized uh, URLs. 3.3, which is you know the legit version of Python, can, but they're not backwards compatible, and the community is a mess. So we gave up on Python. Then we ended up in JavaScript because basically what we needed was a CMS to be able to handle stuff, right? Quite a large amount of stuff. Uh, we looked at uh, PHP and stuff like that because most CMSs today are still based on that. And frankly, I mean, aside from the security holes, you know. The level of spaghetti code and the pain in the rear. That, that entire thing you're seeing is probably two months of work. So in the grand scheme of things, really not that much, right? And and there's like doc templating and you can select language. All that stuff is two months of work, which is not a lot of work when you think about it. And it's all based off this reactive stuff. Uh, what I can do, for example, is create groups. So the hierarchies, entities, groups, users. And then on the publish, filter for which user should see what group. So therefore, you'll never see stuff in a group that you don't have. And because it's part of that library, by default, you have a full folder structure with whatever data you want to put in. So, so I think really quite critical because, uh, dude, I started programming at the start of this year. You know, <laughs> when, when you look at time spent learning versus the ability to get up to speed quickly and make stuff that doesn't look like basically crap. Uh, it's been, it's actually really good fun to play with. Like we, we find, we're, you know, we're going, it looks shiny and it's not optimized at all. Uh, so let's move all the Python stuff into it. Uh, one of the other things you probably, so this is actually pretty heavy, right? Like it's a lot of stuff getting loaded onto the browser. What you do in terms of scaling is you would hive off different bits of it, but have them all connect to the same MongoDB. So your final client-side app can be a skinny, but you can have a dozen instances of it, right? So you know stuff like that. There was just there was nothing else that did stuff like that, you know, because I don't really want to muck around with Docker instances and you know all that stuff. It's just it's just way too much effort. Here I can just split the app, put up. 10 containers, which is 10 instances of the app. People will come in on any instance, and they could have come in on a different instance earlier, still all go to the same MongoDB. And, and it just, like, it, it was, dude, I'm an evangelist, and these guys don't pay me. So, you know. Well, that's great answer. Thanks. OK, uh, thank you very much, Ted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Do I just unplug?
Put it just on the plug. Uh, yeah. Our next talk is going to be about uh, email with GPG. Uh, before I do, um, someone over here was saying.